Excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, February 28th meeting of the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Uh, I appreciate everybody in the uh, population who are there. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Commissioner Avila. Commissioner Estrada uh, let us know she was not going to be able to be present. Commissioner Gavidia also is not going to be present. Commissioner Grimmick. Present. Commissioner Hisserick. Commissioner Hisserick. John, you're muted. I, I see Commissioner Hisserick. You just unmuted. Okay. He, he waved yes. Commissioner Hisserick is present. Commissioner Kata will join us at 6.30. Commissioner Galfani, let me know that she was not going to be able to join us. Commissioner Lemus. Present. Commissioner Mandel. Present. Commissioner Osi. Present. Commissioner Pack. Commissioner Shannon. Don't see her on either. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that my count correct? No. Six present. No. You have one, two, two oh, three, okay. four. Five, six. six. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Commissioner Sorota, yes. I'm sorry, yes, I have you present. Um, One, we five, do not. Six, three, four, five, six. So we just need one more. Uh, we'll have a quorum by 6.30 with Commissioner Cato. But uh, we can go ahead and get started with your discussion items. Excellent. Um, uh, mo moving on, then, uh, we're um, uh, honored and blessed, actually, to have some really wonderful, brilliant, uh, world-renowned speakers tonight uh, that we're going to talk about a whole collection of issues, including T-cells, uh, as well as uh, uh, the response to T-cells uh, in the COVID uh, presentation. So uh, we'll start off with, with uh, item number two. Um, and I'd like to uh, publicly thank uh, Antonio uh, Bertoletti, Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, at uh, uh, Duke uh, Medical School, um, who's going to talk about T cell immunity and specifically the inclusion of RTC specific T cells. Um, and we're really thrilled. We've read um, some of the articles you've published. Uh, they're very enlightening, uh, and I think you have a lot to offer, not just the people of the city of Los Angeles, but in our entire world. We're honored to have you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to present some of our data. Uh, I, I present, uh, let's say, I will try to, to be as simple as possible. Uh, if you want to stop me during my presentation, it's absolutely okay. Uh, let me see if I can share my slide. Uh, um, can you see them? Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, beautifully. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, um, my name is Antonio Bertoletti. I am um, an infectious disease doctor, and then I start to do research uh, for, um, I would say, more than 25 years. Actually, I, uh, I started my interest on, uh, on antiviral immunity in uh, La Jolla, where I work at the Scripps Clinic for two, three years. And then I went back to Italy, and now I'm in Singapore at uh, the Duke and U.S. Medical School. Uh, briefly, uh, I've been asked to do a sort of overview about general antiviral immunity. Then I will go a little bit more in the detail to speak about the importance of T-cells in general, in, in SARS-CoV-2 protection. And then specifically, I will go towards, let's say, discussing the T-cell response against the non-structural proteins of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, again, briefly, if you have, I will say, some question, you, you can interrupt me. Uh, virus, when a virus infects uh, the, our organism, what we have? We, we start to have what we call an innate immunity. I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, so the virus infects cells, and we have a, a, a 
triggering of what we call innate immunity, which is mainly production of cytokines like type 1 interferon or activation of the NK cells, which are tried to block the initial viral replication. Uh, the, the cytokines produced are also important because then they're going to mature what these cells that we call dendritic cells that are extremely important because they are going basically to act as a bridge between the innate immunity and the adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity that I'm uh, thematically represented here, that is represented by the T and the B cells. B cells are the cells that are producing antibody when they mature to plasma cells. The T cells are two kinds of uh, T cells, the helper T cells that are important for the maturation, I would say, of B cells. They are basically uh, secreting cytokines that are important for maintaining the um, production of, uh, of, of antibodies and sustaining the, the growth of the B cells. And also, they are sustaining the efficiency of what we call cytotoxicity cells that are T cells that are recognizing directly virus-infected cells. So again, schematically, just again to, to go a little bit more deeply, you have to remember that the B cells, therefore, are producing antibodies that they are extremely important for neutralizing the virus, protecting. They are basically important for the protection from infection. But sometimes, clearly, the antibodies are not sufficient. They could be infection. And at this point, we need the T cells that are not recognizing the virus, but are recognizing the virus infected cells. This is very important to remember. So the T cells, particularly the cytotoxic T cells, they don't recognize directly virus, they recognize the infected cells. And how they recognize them? Well, here again, schematically, I'm trying to, to tell you what a T cell here recognize and how it can basically, a T cell, a CD80 cell can, can recognize the infected cells from a non-infected cell. So again, schematically, virus enter the uh, cells, they start to replicate, and to replicate need to make viral proteins that they are making the, the, the virions. So the viral proteins that are endogenously synthesized, they are processed, they are basically cut in small pieces, and these peptides that we call, again, uh, epitope, these short peptides, usually long, 9, 10 amino acids, they are associated with proteins that are present in our cells. They are called HLA class 1, that they are traveling towards the surface of the infected cells. The cytotoxic T cells recognize, therefore, viral peptide in association with HLA class 1 molecules. HLA class 1 molecules are present in all our cells, or how all our nucleate cells. Uh, so, as I said before, there are two kinds of, of T cells. The CD80 cells, that again, as I told you, they recognize viral infected cells and they like them, but also the CD40 cells. What they recognize, the CD40 cells? Again, they recognize viral antigen, but this is different because in this case, the viral antigen is not, is, let's say, presented to the cells through association with a different HLA class 1, is HLA class 2 molecules. And the difference is that in this case, the antigen is not endogenously produced, but is actually taken out from the outside. This is very important because basically this, the CD4 cells are recognizing that this cell is not infected, is only taking up antigen from outside. Okay. Uh, let me now go a little bit on the virus. I hope uh, I give a short, uh, really schematic introduction about the antiviral effect and particularly the, the importance of, of CD8 and, and CD40 cells. Uh, and now I want to go a little bit on the detail of the virus and I will say this difference between structural and non-structural proteins. Thematically, this is the virus, it's made of different proteins. Again, you know very well the spike protein, everything. The, our vaccine is based on spike protein. The spike protein is necessary for the virus to infect cell through uh, uh, binding the AC2 receptor. There are other structural proteins. But what I want you to, to, to 
understand is actually the structure of proteins represent only one third of all the genome of a virus. All this part is basically non-structural proteins. And here I'm putting again, this is basically the RNA of the virus and they're making these proteins and the non-structural proteins you can see are more than two thirds of the virus. What they're doing, the non-structural proteins? Well, again, they are sort of, let's say, preparing and making the machinery that allow the virus then to replicate better or to block antiviral uh, innate immunity within the cell. So they are basically sort of doing, let's say, the logistic, the infrastructure to then allow the virus to replicate. Again, I want to point out that most of our study, in particular, we say the antibody study, are only specific for spike, mainly specific for spike, where all the studies that have been done, which makes sense because clearly antibody against spike can block, uh, uh, can have neutralization effect. Then we have some idea about the T cell response against nucleoprotein, but we, we really know very, very little about the T cell response against the non structural protein. Uh, now let me go again on, on, on SARS-CoV-2, what we know, what is the importance of, uh, let's say, immunity in uh, uh, the protection of, uh, against this virus. Well, I would say that we need absolutely to, to get uh, on the idea that what is important is not really say, oh, T cells are more important than antibody or antibody are more important than T cells. I think we need absolutely to understand that what is important is the coordinated induction of both the humoral and, and, and cellular immunity. When we have both, when there is a coordination, coordinate activation of both the arms of the immunity, we usually have protection. And I'm quoting here one paper, one of the first papers that was done actually in La Jolla by the group of Alessandro Sett and Shane Crotty that demonstrate that it is important to induce a coordinate induction of humoral and cellular immunity to get protection. Uh, however, we also know that T cells are definitely necessary for the control. This has been done in animal model, and I'm going directly to this data. These are data that were done about uh, two years ago now, where they demonstrate in rhesus macaque that uh, these rhesus macaque are better protected from reinfection if there are CD80 cells. I try to explain uh, uh, briefly the experiments in this slide. You can see here, this is the quantity of the virus. Basically, if the macaque were naive and they were infected, you can see this is the quantity of virus that was detected in the macaque at about 10 days after infection. And here instead, we have uh, the infection of a macaque that has been already infected. So a macaque that has uh, an adaptive immunity against the virus, you can see that there were basically no infection. If from this macaque we delete the T cells, this is what's happening. Again, showing that the T cells are important, are necessary to help the antibody to then block the infection. Okay, so, uh, I mean, in the past two years, we have done many work. Uh, we, we start really to demonstrate the existence of SARS-CoV-2 T cells in patients, but also in uh, unexposed uh, uh, subject. And, and here in Singapore, where I'm working, there have been a, 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 an infection, let's say, about 17 years ago of SARS-CoV-1. And we were able to demonstrate that the patients that got SARS-CoV-1 infection 18 years ago, they still have some memory T cells. Uh, then we have done some other work, but uh, today I just want to go in the details of this uh, uh, um, work that we have done to demonstrate that the early presence of the T cells in patients with acute uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection is very important for uh, the control of the virus. So, um, again, so what we have done here, we didn't study a lot of patients, but here I want to show you basically the, the dynamic changes of the virological and the immunological parameters. What does it mean? Well, we study eight patients with uh, mild symptom and four patients with very acute, moderate and some severe symptom. One patient unfortunately died. And we follow them longitudinally, about let's say three, four days from the symptom onset, during the acute phase of the disease, and then in convalescence. And what we have done here, we study the quantity of virus, 
the quantity of antibodies and the quantity of the T-cells. I think I'm not going to go in the details just for you to know that we study the antibodies with different methods and the T-cells, we study the T-cells mainly to structural region, but also to some non-structural proteins that we will talk uh, more about it. Briefly, quantity of virus correlate with disease severity, something that now we know very well. Two years ago, we started to know, I mean, the quantity of virus is uh, proportional to the severity of the disease. In red and in orange, there, is, there are the patients that have uh, severe disease. In green are the patients that were mild. Uh, again, there were variations, but most of the patients that really clear the infection within, I would say, 10 days, they were the ones that have a very low disease severity. But let's go and see a little bit uh, the kinetics of the antibodies that I represented in this slide. Uh, in the, maybe you can just focus your attention on this figure on the top. This is the quantification of the neutralizing antibody, the presence of neutralizing antibody. Um, and you can see that actually the antibody, also in patients that have severe disease, and these are again the red, they were reaching very high level and they were actually induced very early. There was basically no big difference between uh, uh, the patients that have severe and mild disease in relation to the early response and early production of antibodies and the quantity of antibodies. Actually, the quantity of antibodies seems to be much higher in patients with severe disease, which is something that then has been uh, uh, seen for by many, many other experiments, which doesn't mean that the antibodies are bad. It just means that you don't control the virus. There is large quantity of antigen, so you keep producing large quantity of antibodies. But I want to show these slides, which I think is very, very clear, and represent the kinetics of the total T cell response. Here, we just measure the T cell response, antigen specific, SARS-CoV-2 specific, for different proteins of the virus. And here is the, I would say, presence of these T cells in all the subjects that have mild and moderate disease. And here are the, instead, the data of what we found in the severe disease. I think it's pretty clear that if you are able to basically have antibody and T cells, as indicated here, you are able to control the virus early and without a severe disease. In patients, that have unfortunately severe disease and was actually interested to see that this was the patients that died. We didn't really able to find in the circulation the uh, T cells. So again, showing that high frequency of SARS-CoV-2 T cells is associated with mild disease. Uh, I mean, this, this slide just showed that also it is important to have an early appearance for virus-specific T cells to really correlate with uh, the uh, du uh, short duration of the infection. So first conclusion about this data, before going more on the non-structural proteins in more detail, is again, I, I try to show you, I, I show you that the quantity of virus-specific antibodies actually correlate with the severity, but the quantity of T cells, virus-specific T cells, is associated with mild disease. And the early presence seems to really correlate with the ability to control SARS-CoV-2 infection. And here is schematically represented. When we find T cells immediately and they are a high level, the patients were able to control the uh, disease without, at least, say, severe pathology. Okay. Now I'm going to go a little bit. You asked me to, to speak a little bit more about the non structural proteins. Just again, I want to remind you again these are the structural proteins spike, nucleoproteins, membrane. These are the non-structural proteins, also ORF7 and OR8 are other non-structural proteins. And as I wrote here, all these non-structural proteins are not really, I mean, some are required for viral replication. These ORF7 and ORF8, for example, are not required for viral replication, but perhaps they are important for blocking something of the immune system in this case. So 
I'm going to show you now the data again of these early patients where we start to see that there were something about the response to non-structural proteins that were interesting. So again, in these patients, we study this non-structural protein, ORF7-8, and also this NSP13 that is an ALE case. It's a, it's, it's a different non-structural protein. But what I want to show you here is that we start to notice that in the early phases of the, in, uh, of the infection, we were able to find the T cells particularly specific for this ORF7 and 8. So again, this represent, uh, just let me explain better, this bar represents the frequency of the T cells, the different color represents the frequency of the T cells specific for the different antigen. These are the different patients, and these are the different time points. So you can see that there is this sort of T cell response against non-structural proteins that then disappear at the convalescent phase. So we have these T cells against non-structural proteins that start to be present very early during infection. Here, I'm showing better this, this is the response to the nucleoprotein, classical structural proteins. You can see during the acute phase and during the convalescent, the infrequency increase at the convalescent. The response against the non-structural protein, in particular this ORF7 and 8, instead is it's higher in the acute phase. Now, the question was really, what is the reason of this different kinetics? Why we have these T cells that are specific for these non-structural proteins that start early? Two poss possibilities. One, ORF1 proteins are produced first during the viral replication. So there are these non-structural proteins that are preparing the cells to produce the virus. And therefore, maybe we say the T cells are induced early. The other possibility is that actually we have already some memory SARS-CoV-2, well, COVID-specific T cells that can cross-recognize SARS-CoV-2. So it could be that in the, some patients, some individuals, do have these cross-reactive T cells. And, and this was something that was already seen in our previous work. Here I'm showing, again, the T cell response against nucleoprotein and other non-structural proteins in patients that have COVID-19, in patients that have SARS 17 years ago, SARS-CoV-1, and you can see mainly there is nucleoprotein specificity cells. But when we started to study healthy patients with PBMCs that were taken actually before the arrival of SARS-CoV-2, we noticed that some subjects do have this response against uh, the non-structural proteins of the virus. How it could be that? Okay, so here I'm showing you this data, which represent the sequences of different coronavirus, sarbecovirus, so the, all the different families of coronavirus that infect humans and infect animals. And here in red and with different color are indicated the different homology between the different proteins. This is again ORF1. These are all the non-structural proteins. These are the structural proteins. These are all different viruses. Clearly, there is complete homology in different SARS-CoV-2 strain or we say minor differences. SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to SARS-CoV-1 and there are some uh, homology with MERS. But what I want to show you here is that you can see here this red line that are present basically in this particular protein, NSP12, NSP13. NSP12 is this polymerase, which is important for the replication of the virus. NSP13 is this helicase. So here what we were finding is that actually there was a large homology between SARS-CoV-2, non-structural proteins present in SARS-CoV-2 and in other viruses. So open the possibility that infection with other virus or seasonal coronavirus, or even just contact with other virus, might actually, uh, other coronavirus present in animals, might actually induce this NSP12 response. 
we study this. We took a sample from subjects that were, uh, let's say, uh, samples that were taken before 2018. And we find that these healthy individuals, they do have this NSP12 response. There were some that have this NSP12 response, induced maybe by other seasonal coronavirus or maybe by other virus that we don't know. But it's important to, to, to see, again, that the homology can really say that if you have an NSP12 response might actually respond to many different coronaviruses. But now, how can we really demonstrate that this potential NSP12 response can play a, really a role in the control? Uh, and whether this cell could be cross uh, um, this uh, cross-reactive NSP12 uh, specificity cell can be protected. So uh, this was really a, a different quest, a difficult question to try to answer. So we, we will need basically to, to study subjects that were exposed and then uh, let's say they didn't get infected and have samples before and after exposure, something that is very difficult. But in this case, so we, we, we really start a very good collaboration with uh, London actually, uh, in particular with the laboratory of Mala Marini and uh, with also a, a large consortium of uh, scientists and uh, uh, clinicians in London that actually have done a very fantastic job because they were following uh, healthcare workers in London during the first wave of infection. Uh, and they were following them for a very long time, try primarily to get patients that got acute infection. But among them, they could see that there were a lot of uh, subjects, again here, I write, out of 731 subjects that were followed for 16 weeks, there were 58 that were completely seronegative. No antibody, no uh, uh, demonstration of infection for a, a for very long time. So uh, making the point that probably these were really never infected, or maybe they could have been infected, but then could have been completely controlled uh, the virus through the immune system. And so we, we were able to have the cells from this subject. Again, I want to stress that these uh, uh, subjects were tested repeatedly with PCR, and they were always completely negative. They were always completely negative for antibodies. The T cells analysis was again done against structural proteins and some of the non-structural proteins, again, mainly against NSP12, this polymerase virus. And here I just show the data of the quantity of the T cells that is represented here on the y-axis, that is the number of T cells that were present in the pre-pandemic uh, PBMC of subjects that therefore could have never encountered SARS-CoV-2. These were instead on the right, the quantity of the T cells against different proteins present in the confirmed infection. And this exposed seronegative, you can see that there were differences between the pre-pandemic. So there was some level of T cell response that was increasing. And what, which was the one that was increasing most? It was actually the NSP12 response. So in the patients that have infection, this gray, the T cell response against structural proteins was much higher, but the response to NSP12 was much higher in the exposed seronegative. So this was the first point that told us that there could have been something out of this NSP12 T cell response. And then what we have done was actually, actually what they have done mainly in London. I have to say that our mm, contribution was uh, an initial contribution, and then uh, most of the work was done in, in London. It was actually to distinguish the subjects that were studied between subjects that have uh, this uh, uh, activation of innate immunity. So uh, in London, they demonstrated that if subjects were infected, perhaps even for a short time with virus, they have an activation of these interferon alpha genes. It's a 
there was sort of what we call early transcriptomic signal, signature of COVID-19 infection. So the subjects that were in contact with the virus, they start an innate immunity. And what was interesting to see is actually that the uh, subjects that have this uh, strong response against NSP12, they were actually the one, not all of them, but most of them, they were the one that have uh, a level of activation of, uh, of uh, this uh, innate immune genes, suggesting that really this subject could have been in contact with the virus. Finally, we were also able to have PBMCs of the subject before and after exposure. And when we count, uh, analyze the response against NSP12 on this subject, we can clearly see that there was an increased frequency of this uh, response before and after exposure. So again, really suggesting that these subjects were challenged with the virus but in reality, they were not showing any sign of infection because, as I told you before, the subject remain antibody negative and PCR negative. So, in conclusion, I show you that pre-existing cross-reactive T cell could be possibly induced by closely related coronavirus. Remind you, there was this uh, homology between NSP12 between different coronaviruses. And this uh, T cell can expand upon exposure to SARS-CoV-2. This expansion of polymerase NSP12 T cells is detected in individuals exposed to the virus and with possible abortive infection. And T cell recognizing this uh, polymerase might be effective at early control of the infection. And what I think is important is that since they have uh, really this large homolo uh, homology between different coronavirus, they can potentially be used as a sort of pan-coronavirus uh, uh, vaccine. Let me just go finally to just this sort of hypothetical model, which I try to schematically represent here. Sorry. So the idea is that when the virus is entering the cells, the first proteins that is producing are these non-structural proteins that are basically, again, preparing the virus to replicate. So, and one important protein could be this uh, uh, polymerase cell. Then, when the virus has basically make this NSP12 proteins, it starts to replicate, and then it starts to produce uh, a, a whole virus. So, at this point, in this stage, the epitopes, so the peptides that are presented in the infected cells, will be mainly coming from non-structural proteins. Here, instead, they will come mainly from structural proteins. But therefore, if we have NSP12-specific CD8 cells, we can be in the possibility to really abort the infection. This is why we use the term abortive infection. And I'm finishing here. If you have questions, these are my group that have uh, really participated in all the work that we have done. And again, I want to thank uh, Mara Maini and particularly Leo Swanding here that was uh, the major contributor of the demonstration of the increase of this NSP12 response in subject with abortive infection. Thank you very much. I hope uh, and, yeah, I've uh, not uh, been uh, too complicated. No, that's wonderful. So it's actually a, a, a great overview and introduction as well as uh, explanation um, for the roles of the T cells. A, a, a couple of questions. So, so we know that in the first wave that uh, where you live in Singapore as well as in Hong Kong and in Taiwan, uh, the populations did really, really well, uh, some related to public health uh, and governmental impact uh, shutting down some things, but, but also most likely because of what you explained in that these people had a significant amount of uh, uh, T cells that had memory from um, either SARS uh, or some other uh, coronavirus that helped protect them. Um, and hence, there were less population that had it, so it spread, uh, you know, less, and, and the uh, impact was, was significantly less than we, what we saw, unfortunately, in Italy or uh, Spain or in New York or New Jersey. Um, how would you then explain why on the first wave in Los Angeles, um, our numbers were really um, quite 
Uh, excellent. We did not have the rise as quickly as they did in Southern Europe um, or in uh, New York, uh, in New Jersey. I mean, I, you know, what you mentioned, I think, is, is potentially correct. At the beginning, I was really thinking that there could be here in Asia a, a sort of, let's say, cross-reactivity against different coronaviruses. Uh, now, uh, I, I think one of the big issues of, let's say, difference in the severity of the infection is really the age of the population. I mean, I can speak about Italy. You mentioned Italy. Uh, I do think, you know, in Italy, the first wave for force, particularly severe, particularly also because, I mean, the, the Italy is, in a way, you can say, fortunately or unfortunately, an aging population. Uh, that's one of the points. Then, as far as concern, honestly, the, the, the potential, uh, let's say, effect of other seasonal coronaviruses, which are present a little bit everywhere, I do think they might play a role. Then, of course, I don't want to exaggerate the role. You see, I mean, uh, I, I do think, again, I'm, 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 I'm still stressing every time that uh, T cells are important for control of the pathology, but you need those antibody, and you need antibody against spike to block the infection. And I do think if you have a multi-specific T cell response, so T cells that are responsible for many different proteins, you are going to be actually protected. Therefore, this is why I, I do think even if you have an SP12 response, it's better also to have a, a, a vaccination, that's for sure. But the data that we showed, they really suggesting that other T cells specific for other proteins might be important for protection from disease. Excellent. Um, the other thing is that we unfortunately have know the association or correlation between high BMI um, and or type 2 diabetes, really um, devastating uh, and, and the, the uh, worst severe disease and hospitalization and uh, higher viral numbers. Uh, is there any role for um, either um, high sugar levels, circulating sugar levels, hemoglobin A1Cs, things of that nature? Um, do they have an impact on T cell function, uh, specifically the states? Yeah, I mean, this is not exactly my expertise, uh, but I do, I've read something that, you know, again, obesity and, again, the metabolic uh, uh, characteristic of the individuals are definitely important for the general immune response. So, innate immunity, antibody, anti-cells. I think I stressed at the beginning that it's extremely important to have a coordinator response, uh, T cells must be there. It's important to count the T cells. I think it is. Uh, and I do think there are data in the literature that are showing that, as you said, obesity, uh, diabetes can alter the level of functionality of the T cells, but also, also of other components of the innate immunity. And then uh, two other brief questions, one of which is it's quite apparent that if you have better or more robust T cell response, you're going to clinically do better. And in fact, as you showed in, in, this, in the subgroup of population, you might be exposed to the virus and not even catch it, which is the ideal situation. Um, is there some way that, that the population can uh, increase its T cell um, activity or response? Is there medications that do that or alternatively, um, is there some diet uh, or, or natural um, no. that can do it? Well, listen, I think vaccine, maybe nasal vaccine, I think we should go there. I do think I'm a, a great, uh, I would say, supporter of the general idea also to have a sort of mucosal infection. There are good data now in animal models that are really showing that uh, inducing a good T cell response also in the way port of entry, it will be extremely important. And then the, the, the last question that I have before I open it up to the other commissioners um, is, um, is there a way that we could uh, easily test um, T cell ability or uh, uh, availability so that we could predict who's at much higher risk so we can protect the populations better? I mean, okay, here, I think there is a, a talk about this <laughs> after me, about the quantification. Uh, I mean, T-cells analysis has been thought to be extremely complicated. 
uh, which in a way is true, but on the other way, I think now we start to have, uh, let's say, assay that can simplify the quantification. Uh, now, I think you will hear later about the possibility to detect directly the presence of the T cells to, let's say, uh, looking at the TCR sequencing. Uh, I prefer a different pattern, but you know, there can be really other assay directly in the blood. There is no question that at the moment still is a little bit too complicated and we need probably to make it as simple as possible, sim similar to the antibody test. I think we can get there, to be honest. And w my lab is really try to work now on simple assay that can be really reproducible and easy to do for many different laboratories. Fantastic. What a wonderful uh, presentation in response. Um, I'm going to open it up to the other um, uh, commissioners uh, now, but I just want to point out to the city clerk um, that uh, Commissioner Shannon and Kato um, um, joined us a about 10 uh, 15 minutes ago, um, and after uh, the, uh, other commissioners ask questions, uh, we should um, do the the, the uh, two votes that we're uh, actually just the uh, the vote on on um, uh, the uh, uh, virtual uh, meeting. So we're in compliance with the law. Um, are there any other commissioners that have, have questions? I realize this is a little bit more cell biology than you're used to. Not seeing any hand. Oh, uh, is there any hands up? I don't see any. Well, you've been so um, uh, informative that uh, the commissioners are just. Uh, um, I, I hope so. But thank you for your question. They were really so. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. So uh, before we move on to, to the next agenda item, uh, uh, can uh, I think uh, Commissioner Vice President Grimmig was going to make a motion. Uh, Barack, do I need to call roll again, or are we okay with um, going forward, knowing, uh, noting that Commissioners Kalfani and Kato have joined and we now have a quorum? That's fine. Okay. Uh, this is Commissioner Shannon. I'm also on, and I've been on since 6.06. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So, Mac, did you want to make a, a, a motion in regards to the... Um, AB 361 motion? Yeah, let me uh, just pull it. All right, here we go. So I move that the Los Angeles uh, City Health Commission determine in accordance with AB 361, Section 3E3, that this legislative body has reconsidered the circumstances of the state of emergency and that the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members to meet safely in person and or state or local officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. I have a second. Second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of... Uh, no, you need to call a roll call. Thank you, uh, Counselor. Uh, uh, Rita, could you call the uh, roll, please, in accordance with the law? Commissioner Avila is absent. Commissioner Estradas is absent. Commissioner Gaviria is absent. Commissioner Grimmig. Approved. Commissioner Hissarek. <laughs> Commissioner Cato. Approved. Commissioner Kalfani is absent. Commissioner Lemus. No, no, no Kalfani's here. Oh, I'm here now. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Lemus. Approved. Commissioner Mandel. Approved. Commissioner Osi. Approved. Commissioner Pack is absent. Commissioner Shannon. Approved. Commissioner Sirota. Approved. Motion carries. Thank you. Just for our presenters, uh, 
uh, California law. Normally, we, we meet uh, in in uh, City Hall in beautiful chambers. Um, though we're actually very lucky uh, to have you from around the world uh, uh, come and present to us. We really totally appreciate that. Um, Zoom is is not as beautiful uh, as our chambers, uh, um, which are much more impressive than than uh, my son's uh, old room. Uh, with uh, old journals in the back. But having said that, uh, we are required by law to have that book um, to, in order to have our uh, commission function. So um, thank you for being patient with us. Um, so um, moving uh, uh, on, our, our next presentation um, is going to be from uh, Dr. Uh, Harlan Robbins, who's the Chief Scientific Officer and Co-Founder of Adaptive uh, Biotechnologies. Uh, discussing the need to measure T cell response in vaccine trials, as well as uh, the importance of including T cell response in public health interventions. Uh, Dr. Robbins, we're also thrilled to have you uh, on, and um, feel free to also comment uh, on Dr. Bertoletti's uh, uh, presentation if you want. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, that was a very nice. Uh, uh, overview um, from Dr. Bertoletti, so um, hopefully we are grounded in, in a good place to start. Um, I'll start sharing my slides, which hopefully goes okay. Uh, is that, is it visible to everybody? I'll put it in presentation mode. Everybody see it? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, before I jump into my slides, um, I'm going to give the sort of a, I would say a, a, a way of thinking about the immune system that, that's in, in, in my simple view just an easier way to um, assess the adaptive immune system. Um, virus, viruses are called uh, obligate intercellular parasites, and that means that they can't reproduce by themselves. They have to use the machinery in human cells in order to be able to reproduce. So effectively, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, they have to in, um, infect your lung cells and then think of your lung cells as the factory that, that these viruses need to make more viruses to reproduce. And so they infect the lung cells, uh, make lots of copies of themselves, and then shed out in, outside the cells and infect um, many other cells and then can get out of your system and infect other people. So there's two parts, our, 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 two parts of our adaptive immune system defend against this. One are, are B cells, which make antibodies, and the other are T cells. So B cells primarily prevent uh, those viral particles from getting into the factories, into lung cells in the first place. So they're effectively, think of them as the, as the they, they, they kind of block the door to the factory. But once those viral particles get into the factory, then there's no, the, the antibodies are, are, are effectively useless. And, but what T cells do is they can come and blow up the factory and they can kill the, kill the, kill the lung cells that, that are, are making the virus. And so what, you, what the dogma in, 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 in um, immunology is that antibodies prevent you from getting infected, but then T cells are what clears an infection and makes you better, okay? So they, they, this is how these two things work together. So it turns out that, that the dogma is actually proven to be very close to correct, if not perfectly correct. Let me see if I can advance my slide here. There we go. Okay. So in, in SARS-CoV-2. So what's happened in, 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 in SARS-CoV-2 is if you look along the, the, the x-axis, the horizontal line here, in this graph, I just plotted um, the, this virus as it mutates um, from the, the original strain from Wuhan to Alpha, Beta, Delta, and then Omicron. And then across the top is how, um, basically how effective our, our vaccines are and, and, what, and what kind of production of uh, antibodies or T cells are made against, by these vaccines against each one. And so as you can see, as this virus um, evolved, the antibodies, the neutralizing antibodies that were induced by the vaccine are, are just become more and more off target. That's this orange level. So they, they basically are no longer doing a good job of fighting the virus. And you look at this gray line where we see uh, the, the rate of getting infected among the people who, who or the, the prevention from getting infected among, among people who are vaccinated, it drops as the, as the virus becomes more and more off target, as, as, as the vaccine-induced antibodies become more and more off target. 
However, the T cells stayed almost completely on target, except for Omicron, which we'll get to in a second. But for even all the way through Delta, the variations didn't do much to knock, uh, knock out um, the T cell response to, to at all. And in conjunction with that, the clinical data, which is this dark line here, it's hard to see because it's literally laying on top of the T cell line. And that's because the, the um, actual symptomatic or severe disease that you would get from in the, among the vaccinated people, basically uh, it, it, it didn't, didn't occur in those who were vaccinated, right? It, it, we were highly, highly, highly protected against severe disease with, with, or even, even symptomatic disease. Um, and that's why they called, you know, even Delta was the, 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 the vaccine, the, the you know, dis disease of the, of the unvaccinated, the virus, the unvaccinated. Then Omicron hit, and now the um, antibody level went down so, so low. I, I haven't plotted them yet because the final data isn't really in yet, but the, the antibody response to Omicron is almost non-existent. And so the infection rate among people who, who were vaccinated, as we all know, is, is really, really high. So this gray line went all the way down. But we still know that those who were vaccinated, they did, you know, including myself, got, got um, sick, but not severely sick. And so there's some increase now. This, this, probably this black line is going to still lay on top of the blue line. So, so basically the point is, is that, is that um, SARS-CoV-2 is, is a moving target. And I'll show you in a minute that T cells lay this great foundation because it's very hard to avoid the full T cell response whereas it's very easy to avoid the antibody response. And so over time, what we end up with is a, in an endemic state is going to be a state where we have a quite stable um, T cell response, hopefully, that prevents people from really getting severely ill and dying, unless there's some other cause. So what's the, what, what can um, assessing T cells help us answer? Well, first, we, we need to know then if, if the virus is going to escape the antibody response quite readily, we need to be able to understand what happens to the T cell response over time, because this is going to set public policy on, on how we give boosters out and, and um, et cetera. Um, and then as, as um, uh, Commissioner Mandel um, asked before on, on different populations, like including the, the, um, uh, over obese populations, et cetera, there can be significant um, disparities in, in between different um, groups who get vaccinated. As we all know, um, the, well, one thing that just came out, the vaccine on the 5 to 11-year-olds isn't working very well. We just learned that yesterday. Um, the, unfortunately, um, we, are, we already know that the, the elderly and immune compromised, uh, I'm not going to show you data, but we have lots of data on, on how this impacts subgroups like the immune compromised um, and that there, some subset of them don't respond very well to vaccines and others do. We need to be able to distinguish that so we, we know uh, how to set policy and, and whether it's giving increased doses of vaccines or, or making sure that they're aware that they're at much, much higher risk so they can affect their behavior. Um, and then, of course, we can, does, you know, let's be, we, we need to be a little bit honest here. This wasn't, when we um, set out, we as in the scientific community set out to create a vaccine. The vaccine was designed strictly to induce antibodies against this strain. And we got really lucky, and I'll show you in a minute, that, that this vaccine also induced a really nice T cell response. Because if they hadn't, the minute this virus started mutating, the, vi the vaccine would have been rendered very, very close to useless. But we got really lucky, and that's what formed this foundation that's keeping us from getting severely ill. Um, but we don't need to get lucky. Now we have the information. We can design the next generation of vaccines, and there are people doing it, um, that can take account this fact that, that you can induce a really good T-cell response. Um, and then, you know, we need to be able to do this at the individual level, um, and, and then we need to assess specifically the impact of the different variants. And the hard part about T-cells um, they're, as, as was just mentioned, they're, they're difficult to measure. Um, and so what we did, and we've been working on, among others, is how to create a, an assay, a method of, of measuring T cells that's, that, that doesn't require live cells and functional assays, something that's impossible to do at scale. So we wanted to reduce it to something that was robust and could be really done at scale. And um, I think we accomplished that, and I'll show you some data on that as well. Okay. So... Uh, first order of business on this. Um, so, the SARS-CoV-2 is a is a, a a very big RNA virus. 
it's 30,000 30, uh, nucleotides long, basis, A, B, A, um, A, C, G, and T, the code for, for, for its, its um, different genes. And what we did is we mapped out the, the T cell response across this entire virus. So this is just laying out the virus, um, you know, just as a, you just, we just numbered it across this, this uh, X axis here, or, or the horizontal axis. Um, and the, the, sort of the amount of, of, of T cell response that we saw across the different population is, is, is these lines in blue. And as you can see, there's blue lines across this entire uh, virus, right? It's, it's a, there's a pretty significant T cell response across the whole virus. However, the vaccines are only induced against this little gene here called spike, which is about a tenth of the virus. Okay, so you're really missing a good portion of the immune T cell response. But as we'll see, it was designed to induce an antibody response, and that is really targeted right at this area. And I'll show you why. I'll tell you why in a second. But first, what happened with Omicron? Well, Omicron. So here is the I laid out the this the, the spike protein, which is which is as a um, a little over um, a, a thousand um, amino acids, which is the which are the the building blocks of what make proteins, and so. The point is, is that is that this is the this sort of just a linear laid out version of the of the spike spike protein, and these red lines are where Omicron has a mutation relative to to the Wuhan strain. So you can see there's a lot of them. There's there's um, over 30 mutations in spike alone in Omicron versus the Wuhan strain. So it's a pretty different virus than than we created the vaccine against, which was the initial strain. So how how come it? Why does it still work? Well. The, the, way the, um, the way our antibodies neutralize the virus is that the, the spike protein has, it's called spike because it has these little spiky tips on it. And those spiky tips bind to a, a, a gene on the lung cells called the ACE2 receptor, and that's how they get into the cell. That's how they open the gate to get into the factory. However, um, the... It's a really small region, and as you can imagine, the virus is mutating very heavily in that region because any time it improves that binding or changes the binding to, the, to ACE2, it can improve the virus. So it's, it's mutating like crazy right in that spot. And so as you can imagine, so basically the neutralizing antibodies and, and the, the, the spot where the virus is mutating are both exactly hitting the same spot, and that's this highly intense region of red right here. That's it. So you can imagine then that this number of mutations like absolutely obliterates the neutralizing antibody response to this virus. That's why that's why we were everybody who got vaccinated. The vast majority are still getting are getting infected with Omicron. Um, but the T cell response we we um, laid out in black here, and you can see that it's many many different spots all over the virus. These are the two different types of T cell responses that that um, the professor just told you about before. And you can see that their overlap isn't that strong because they're so broad across here. So we only lose a little bit of, of, of the T cell response, like 20, 30 percent of the T cell response, not, not the 99 percent that you'd lose on the antibody side. So that's why even though we had this massive um, uh, mutation load from in the new strain, it's still we're getting effect, effic efficacy from, eff efficacy from the um, uh, vaccine in terms of the T cell response. Um, so. One thing that we'd like to ask is, okay, how long does this ha last and what happens over time? So um, let's just, for, for sake of time, let's just focus on the left here. The, the, um, these uh, people that we plotted in, in, in this uh, orangey color are, um, are the people who got vaccinated. And this is the breadth of the, this is sort of the number of different types of T cells they're inducing against spike. And, Oh, this is over 10 months. It, it wanes, but it's still easily measurable and above zero. If you boost these guys, it goes way back up. And so, and this is this is a long study. This is almost a year and a half study. And with one boost, you can get these this group of people to have a, a, a really strong, sustainable T cell response, which is very encouraging. And then, if you look at this, um, you know, more directly in a finer tooth as to a uh, uh, version of what happens over time, if we look at the x-axis on this plot on the left here, it's saying that between, um, it just lays out in, in the first, you know, uh, six, seven months what happens um, in terms of the T-cell response, that y-axis is the, the, the fraction of total T-cells in your system um, that are 
specific for SARS-CoV-2, and you can see that they it goes up in peaks around um, it, it peaks around uh, uh, four weeks and then starts dropping off and then stays relatively flat and strong for 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 many many months. On the left side, the infection, and the right side, the mRNA vaccines, and they do as well. They they start falling off. It, on the on the vaccination side, in between six and eight months, they start reducing, but but they're still measurable even at you know a year out easy. Okay, so so what, let's go to the the so what's the the issue, um, and and what's the difference between natural vac vaccination and 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 natural infection and vaccination? So what you can see on the left the this brown color here. Is is the T cell percent that you're get the T cell number that you're getting when you get a natural infection, and the other colors on, left of that are are the response you get from from vaccine. You get a nice response, but as you can see, it's not as nice as the natural infection. So let's dig in and ask why. Well, it, within spike, you get almost the same T cell response as you do from natural infection. The reason natural infection produces a bigger overall response is that outside of spike, there's obviously no response to any of the vaccines because they don't carry any of that material. They they're, they're don't exist in the vaccine, whereas they do exist in the virus and produce a nice T cell response. So this gives a lot of opportunity for improving our vaccines. If we, we, there's all this other spot on the virus that we could be attacking and inducing an immune response to that would be perfectly on target for the T cells. And yet, that's not how our first generation of vaccines was designed. So um, there's now new vaccines coming, and we'd like to, and we're we're sort of helping these people to determine exactly where to design the new vaccine against. Um, and as uh, as um, the professor told you on the last uh, talk, um, what class two versus class one? Class one are the are the T cells, they're called killer T cells. They're the ones that kind of blow up the factory. And class two are the helper T cells that both help antibodies and to help the killer T cells. So, so they kind of control the system, whereas the, the, the class ones are the killers. Um, and you can see, and this was the biggest surprise I think of all, is that the, no one expected the, the vaccines to induce killer T cells, but they all induce a pretty nice set of killer T cells. And this is probably what what's been saving us for severe in, from severe infection in some of the um, cases, the, the breakthrough cases um, of people who are getting vaccinated. Um, okay, uh, so okay, so the hard question then becomes, uh, how do you measure this at scale? We all know that that the T cell response plays a, a massively important role in, in immunology. I mean, it's it's half of the adaptive immune system, but it's not, there's no, um, it's never been a, a required, uh, 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 there's never been a required assessment by the FDA when submitting a vaccine. Um, it's not standard part of large, large scale vaccine trials, and it's not measured in, in, in public health in any reasonable way. And part of that was, was just a practical issue, which is that, you know, antibodies are excreted into the sera from B cells. No one measures properties of B cells. They measure the antibodies, which are these, these single molecules that are just floating in your system, and they're really easy to measure. It's technology we've had for over 50 years. T cells don't excrete their receptors. They, 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 they're, they're, they're particles that float around your system. And because of that, um, they're much, much harder to measure. And the, the traditional way people have assessed them is through um, functional assays where you need those cells to be preserved as live cells so they can react to things. Now, as you can imagine, you know, if you're running a global vaccine study, first of all, live cells, they don't, they're very temperamental um, once, you, <laughs> once they're taken out of their system. So preserving them as live cells and then getting them to functionally perform and do it in a robust way is massively expensive and, and very, very difficult. Um, and it's never been done at scale. So what we did is we said, okay, can we, this is what we've done for the last couple of years, is say, is there a way we can take that same information but ex in, turn it into an assay that can be run in a, in a, in a very straightforward, um, robust way that can be done at scale? And so that's what we did. Um, and what we did is we just said the, the receptor that codes 
the, the, the sequence that codes for those T cell receptors, which determine what it binds to, we can, it's just DNA, so that's super stable. We can get it out of blood stored in just about any way possible. And we created an assay that just pulls that information. We just sequence it. And then the key is then identifying which sequences are specific to SARS-CoV-2. And so that's what we, we've teamed up with Microsoft to make this big map between um, the, the T cell receptor sequences and, and the SARS-CoV-2 genome, which I showed you before. And, that, and that's sort of the heart and soul of turning immunology or cellular immunology into something you can do with a standard molecular test. And we then went and got it FDA approved. Um, it's called T-Detax. Um, so it's, you know, it's a validated, robust assay, which is, has been uh, very nice. Um, and, you know, I know it's, hopefully there'll be many more, uh, you know, uh, additional assays that are able to make measuring the adaptive, the cellular adaptive immune system practical. And so anyways, now this has been run, you know, on, on 100,000 plus people, certainly at the scale where we could, we could, um, uh, run it at for, against a full-scale vaccine trial with 30, 40,000 people with, without too much problem. So it is possible to do this now is what I'm trying to say. So going back just as a reminder of what I've um, done in a second, but just going back to reminders of what um, assaying T cells, assessing T cells can, can help us answer, right? So um, all of these questions that, that we talked about before, I think are now within our, 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 our sites. And, and we need to aggressively go after them. Um, and, you know, we're still getting the excuse that it can't be done at scale, and so it, it's not possible to do this, but it is now. And so we we got to move beyond that excuse and, 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 and go do it. So um, I guess if part of the ask here was a call to action, and I would say that um, one is the, the, the broad inclusion of, of the T cell assessment in, in research on on the immune response to COVID and COVID vaccines. I mean, the, the U.S. government created this, uh, put together a massive amount of money towards assessing the serology or antibody response to SARS-CoV-2, and none of that, or almost none of that, went to assessing the T-cell response, which in retrospect probably wasn't um, the, the most productive use of the, of the money. Um, and, you know, obviously, it's not that the, I mean, antibodies, which is the humoral response, is, is super important. It's not that we shouldn't do that, but we need to do both, and we need we need them to be required because that's what's going to motivate the the vaccine makers. If they're not asked to do something, it, you know, you're you're less likely to have them do it. If it's required, then all of a sudden they're going to start measuring it, and they'll realize, hey, this version of the vaccine produced a great T cell response, and this doesn't. This is the one we need to go for because that's the one that's going to protect our population, um, and. For on our end, we also need to establish exactly what those quantitative numbers that, that I was showing you we can measure. How do they correlate to the real, you know, the, the holy grail question is, are you protected or not? Right? That's really the question. Are you going to get sick? And if we can make that quantitative correlation, then, then, then we, um, the road is kind of clear to how to use this to, 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 sort of, to, to help, uh, help set policy and, and, and improve health across, across the, the, the world. Um, I'll end there, and, and uh, thank you for listening. I know it's late for everybody, but thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, so the qu question I would have is, is kind of following up on the last thing that you said: is is that can this be used so that we can find individuals who are uh, uh, have enough of T cell uh, uh, innate T cell protection, so they're not going to get infected? And then the sub question to that would be. Um, that they might get infected, but they're not going to get seriously ill. So, you know, can this be not just done in research studies or in uh, vaccine trials, but is it the kind of thing that can be utilized for the general population um, so people can understand their own personal risk? Yeah, so in, in answer to the first question of whether you get infected or not, the answer is probably no. But in answer to the second question, I think uh, I, I believe the answer is going to be yes. Um, we have a ways to go to prove that on the individual level because there's other cofactors that are relevant and everything else, and we haven't set the exact threshold. But now that we have a, 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 a robust, standardized method for measuring the, the, the specific T cell response against SARS-CoV-2, it, it's certainly on the extreme ends. I'm 100% I'm sure it's going to be true, which is that you know if you have a massive T 
T-cell response uh, in memory against SARS-CoV-2 versus someone who doesn't have any, your severity of disease is going to be vastly different, right? Um, as to whether the correlation really works linearly in a, in a very nice way, we have to prove that out and where the thresholds are. But the information is, is, is likely to be there, and I think we will be able to get there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting looking at the last um, speaker, uh, Dr. Berletti showed uh, that subgroup of population that had a very robust T cell response and never got antibody uh, reaction. So, you know, for some segment, some one cohort, um, they're really well protected. And so it'd be kind of interesting for some individuals, even if it's costly, some people would uh, want to see if what their risk ratio would be. It'd be kind of interesting uh, whether that would be clinically applicable at all. Um, the second question I would have is, you know, clearly we have monoclonal antibodies that we can give. Um, is, is there something that one could do that you could test before and after to show that there's an improved T cell response? Um, after getting a monoclonal antibody? Uh, either monoclonal antibodies or some, you know, another, I mean, you know, some uh, adjuvant that you, you know, is another medication or, or chemical that uh, turns on the T cells. So we are working right now with, um, and, and I can't share the data yet um, because it's, we're working with a, a pharma partner on doing exactly that. It was assessing the the um, the T cell response when when coupled with a uh, uh, when when administered a, a, a monoclonal antibody. Um, you know, uh, and this is one of the couple that where the monoclonal antibody is still on target. Which there are a lot of them aren't working anymore against Omicron, but this is one that still is. So, so I think we're excited about about the results. And and um, but it's a it's a great question, and and I think it's important because you know monoclonal antibodies are you know would have uh, much better value if they're also coupling and inducing a T cell accompanying T cell response. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any of the other commissioners uh, want to raise your hands and and ask a question? Dr. Bertoletti, do you have, do you have a question uh, for Dr. Robbins? Uh, yes, actually, if I can. Uh, so you think you can actually be able to detect uh, the possible the T cells again that are still able to respond to Omicron? So let's say with your methods that are able to respond to Omicron. Well, let's say, I mean, if you can able to, to, let's say, have an idea whether Omicron is going to impact to your T cells. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have in our, our, our um, we've mapped about 10,000 different T cell receptors to, that, are, that occur in the, in the population uh, to, to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the positions that are, that are affected by Omicron um, we know um, exactly which T cell receptors bind to those, so we know okay. which are knocked out or at least potentially knocked out. Now there could be some weird effect where the where that mutation doesn't affect the, the T cell response, but but um, you know for the most part we have um, a fairly accurate um, assessment of which mutations are are uh, affecting which T cells um, T cell receptors. Okay. You, you can basically say, yeah, I mean, I have T cells that are going against conserved region. Correct. Thank you. That's right. Uh, and I'll probably destroy your name, and I apologize for this, but uh, Dr. Tefesi, um, do, do you have a, a question for Dr. Robin? Um, and you don't have to. And uh, now I think I think I have a, a, actual a lot of questions. I say uh, that was a very very insightful. Um, so my question was, um, uh, when do you think we start to get T cell um, responses after vaccination or after natural infection? When that actually start to begin? Do you know? The, the I mean, T -cell it, it, mm -hmm. yeah, the T cell response comes up very fast. So it's it's usually within a few days. Um, the the um, antibody response follows, um, and and the reason is, is as I was saying before, which is that um, 
antibodies only prevent infection. They don't clear infection. So they don't, they're not much help once you've gotten infected. So, th so they, can, they can come on later. It doesn't matter as much. The T cells have to come on very quickly because once you get infected, they have to start clearing that infection as fast as they can. So we see it qu quite quickly. Right. So this brings me to the next question. Do you know the, how far out actually they will stay? Um, a year, two years, ten years? So from natural infection, we're, we're able to observe. I mean, you know, obviously there's, we don't have infinite time because there, it hasn't been around that long. But, but we certainly are in, at a year out, we're, we're, we're detecting T cells in, in, uh, that are, we can literally diagnose people as having, having had Omicron a year ago and 90 plus percent of people that got it. So it's, it's certainly at the year level where they're still readily detectable in, and separated from the, from the people who weren't infected. Um, now the world's getting confusing a little bit because, you know, so many people have been <laughs> infected and reinfected and vaccinated, et cetera. But, but um, the, we had some really clean studies from, from, from early on that, that show that the T cells are quite terrible. Can I add one thing? Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, two points. One, uh, I, we, we study the T cell response immediately after vaccination, and I can confirm the answer of Robbins. I mean, we can find the T cells uh, spike specific after messenger and a vaccination within five days. And actually that's correspond to the, to the, let's say the clinical data that are showing that the vaccine protection against the symptomatic infection is start within, uh, let's say the first 10 days after the second dose, which where we find already the T cell response. And as far as concern, let's say also the long-term presence of the T cells, again, this is not induced by the vaccination. But we were able to find the SARS-CoV-1 specific T cells in subjects that were infected 17 years ago. The frequency is low, the quantity is probably not sufficient, but they are still there. So really the memory response is still present for a long time. And, and I'm assuming, Dr. Bertoletti, if those, those patients were then exposed to um, either uh, the uh, the SARS virus um, or, or um, uh, COVID-2, um, then they would bump their memory and their numbers would yeah. go, wouldn't they? Actually, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly now we follow some subjects that have SARS-CoV-1 infection. Uh, I mean, there were two interesting points. One was mainly about actually antibody response, which uh, they, they actually, after infection and after vaccination, both, they can mount a much broad repertoire of antibodies that at the beginning was extremely effective for protection. Now for Omicron instead, we have SARS-CoV-1, ex-SARS-CoV-1 uh, uh, patients, which were infected uh, because again, the antibodies here, they start really not to be useful. But again, the, the, the infection was very mild in terms of pathology which again reaffirm what actually we both said, that the T cell seems to be important for the control of the disease. Excellent, great. Um, um, and then um, our, our next presenter, uh, we're also thrilled uh, to have, again, I'm, I'm, I, if, please correct me if I mispronounce your, your name, uh, Professor uh, Fikadu uh, Tafese. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, good. I'm, uh, I lucked out. Uh, who, who's a uh, professor of uh, molecular microbiology and immunology at uh, Oregon Health and, and Sciences. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, the COVID-19 antibody response and variant cross-neutralization. Thank you for, uh, we're honored to have you join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Do you see my slide? All right. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, I don't need to go uh, to provide a lot of introduction. I think I think um, the, the previous two speakers gave a really nice introduction for my talk. So um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, to tell you about um, our work for the last you know two years or so now. Um, 
regarding the antibody mediated uh, immunity against SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the variant. Um, so I think uh, everyone in this audience uh, knows that you know it's just, we are still the, in, in, in the pandemic. Um, uh, there is a lot of days, um, uh, but I think one thing that uh, really, um, as we go through this pandemic, um, as the previous uh, speaker uh, alluded to, uh, we have been going through really a lot of uh, phases or stages of uh, the pandemic. Uh, first was you know, um, before the vaccination starts, we had COVID patient infections, um, and then we had um, vaccinations. And after that, um, uh, we, we we had um, a, a COVID-19 individu uh, infected individual that were vaccinated. Um, and, then, and then some people were vaccinated and then they had breakthrough infections. Um, and so I'm, trying to just give you an overview of their uh, immunity in terms of their antibody responses. Um, the role of natural infections, uh, vaccinations, uh, previously infected and vaccination, vaccination and breakthrough infections, uh, all in terms of um, antibody uh, responses and their role in neutralizing um, uh, the different variants. Uh, so, um, our, I just want to uh, provide some background for our um, uh, for our studies. Um, as I've said at the very very beginning of the pandemic, we established um, two important cohorts. The first one is convalescent serum donors. This is a cohort that contains um, uh, individuals that were infected. And some are asymptomatic, some are asymptomatic, some are. Uh, uh, um, hospitalized in ICU and so on. So we we had we collected those samples, and the other one was um, those people that were infected. These are, by the way, all OHSU um, uh, healthcare workers. Um, but the convalescents are also, are not necessarily OHSU um, uh, healthcare workers, but also from the community. So we had in the vaccinated individual uh, cohort, we had around uh, 2,000 um, participants, but from that we selected just a subset of that um, that represented uh, the age group and then also um, uh, sex. So we try to be very representative as, as much as we can. And this is this work was done in collaboration with uh, my colleagues here at Oregon Health and Science University, uh, Dr. Marcel and Bill Messer, who both are physician scientists in our department. So uh, again, um, as, as I think as a starter, I just want to describe one of the most important. Um, I say that we describe it. This is maybe very technical, but I, anyway, I'm going to tr and I'm going to try to describe it. This is the work that we do in biotech level three. Uh, that is called focus forming assay. Um, this is basically just a, uh, an assay that we use to measure the ability, the neutralizing ability of um, uh, our antibody to basically prevent the infection by the original strain, the alpha, beta, gamma, omicron, and so on. So basically, the, it, 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 prov it measures the amount of the antibody that are able to prevent infection. And then we call it that FRNT50, or focus reduction neutralization test. So I'm going to say again and again, but anyway, this is, we use live virus for our assays, and uh, as opposed to some of the other assays that people use uh, usually in the field. Um, um, so, uh, so the first thing that we compared was we measured the antibody levels of naturally infected individuals and vaccinated individuals. When I said vaccinated individuals, are, these are actually after two doses of the vaccine. And then the, what we here is uh, we measure uh, recept that spike specific, specifically the receptor binding domain uh, specific antibodies. Um, and uh, as you can see, there is a significantly less amount of uh, antibody in 
COVID patients as compared to the vaccine. Uh, this is the one thing that I want to uh, uh, emphasize is that the scale, the limit of detection that we use for uh, natural infection is very low uh, as compared to the other ones. Um, this is just to show that um, uh, I think this has been shown again and again by other as, um, by others in the field as well. Natural infection, when it comes to uh, antibody levels, there is huge variability between individuals. Um, as compared to the vaccine, where you almost guaranteed to, to 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 provide a very very robust antibody response. Uh, this is uh, the neutralization assay that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, again, I'm comparing natural infection with the vaccinated individuals. Um, in the, and in this case, I'm showing um, the alpha variant B117 is the alpha and, and then the South Africa variant, which is the, uh, the beta variant. There is a significant reduction um, to neutralize uh, the, the variant um, as expected. Uh, there is more reduction in natural infected uh, patients as compared to the vaccine. One thing I want to emphasize here, um, as opposed to the, the, the T-cell response that we, uh, we, we had earlier, there is actually a very significant drop. We were not able to detect any antibody response against the, uh, the neutralizing titer. I'm, I'm referring to neutralizing titer. In, 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 for example, in 43% of the individuals that had COVID, they were not able to neutralize virus, but they were positive for uh, PCR. For alpha, I even mean, get 54% of the individuals who are not uh, able to neutralize, uh, and for beta, even worse. So uh, again, this is this is just to show that there is huge variability in natural infected individuals as compared to the vaccine, and that is why I think it is important to emphasize that the the, the vaccine kind of guarantees you uh, protection as compared to. Of uh, infection only. Uh, and here uh, we just compare. Uh, we here I'm just focusing the vaccine cohort um, again, uh, just to show there is uh, quite a drop uh, reduction in, in, in neutralizing titer um, as compared to the original strain, the Wuhan strain, um, for which is the the significant we see the significant drop for the beta. Uh, gamma uh, four fourfold uh, reduction from the delta. We saw actually uh, a relatively less reduction as compared to the uh, the original strain. Um, so one thing that that was very obvious in our cohort was um, the in, in the athlete and vaccinated individuals who were able to compare. Um, uh, if we just compare the, the different age group there is a significant reduction um, in, in older people um, that were vaccinated with the, with the two doses of the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. So meaning that there is a negative correlation between age uh, and antibody level. Uh, this is this, uh, the, the, the uh, and then the, 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 this significance is actually, the correlation is even more stronger uh, when we look at the neutralizing titer, the ability of those antibodies to neutralize or to block infection, at least in the, the lab setting, right? So the point is uh, that if you vaccinate individuals that are in the 20s versus in the 70s, there is almost seven-fold reduction in the ability of those antibodies to neutralize. So the older you get, the less you produce antibodies, which is, I think, very important. Uh, uh, important thing to notice. Uh, so uh, this is this is also uh, true for not only for the original virus but also for uh, the the uh, the variant as well. Here we are just showing the P1 variant. Um, uh, 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 so which is also a significant reduction in older people. Uh, and uh, we also compared the sex versus neutralization, and also we uh, in vaccine response and also antibody response. We didn't really see a, a, a significant a difference between these two groups, although 
female individual seems to have high level of antibody as well as neutralization, neutralizing titers. Uh, but that difference doesn't seem to be very different. But this is uh, consistent across the 2,000 uh, individuals, uh, the cohort that we had. Um, and then, uh, as I said earlier, as we go through the, 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 uh, uh, the pandemic, those individuals that were that had COVID, they get vaccinated when they, the, the vaccine came on. And then we were able to actually measure those, uh, the antibody response of those individuals, right? Um, there is a significant re uh, increase um, in those individuals that were uh, vaccinated. Actually, I take that back. The, num the amount of antibody as such uh, is not very significantly different, but but uh, the ability of those antibodies to neutralize in, in previously infected individuals, which is shown here in blue, uh, is significantly increased as compared to only vaccinated that did, were not um, uh, infected before. So previous exposure with the virus uh, uh, significantly improves the, 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 the antibody response and a neutralization. Uh, again, this, this, this is just to show across the different variants, the alpha, beta, and gamma, there is a significant increase. And that, that increase even more stronger in variant, uh, in this case in the alpha, um, the, and then and, and also for the, for the uh, beta as well. Um, so again, um, in our cohort, the cohort that we established earlier, the people that were vaccinated, they obviously, as, as the pandemic goes on, they were, they had a breakthrough infection. And then we went on and then collected um, uh, uh, samples and we measured the amount of uh, antibody and also uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the amount of those antibodies to neutralize the different variants of the virus, right? And, and we, we see the bottom line is that there is a significant increase in antibody response after uh, breakthrough infections. And then and, and, uh, uh, in this case, um, we don't really see uh, this are the different uh, subset, uh, subclasses of um, antibody IgG, IgA, and IgM. We don't see a difference in IgM level. Uh, but we do see a, a, diff, a significant increase in IgG and IgA level. And the neutralization uh, level just goes through the roof. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, sometimes we get tenfold, and then uh, other times in some individuals, we even get up to 20, 30 fold increase uh, after breakthrough infection. So basically what this means is that vaccination provides this, um, a foundation um, of a protection um, that uh, when when people get um, uh, infected, then then hopefully they you know the, whatever they get is mild, uh, it's, it's not a severe disease, but also they have this huge re immune immune uh, response that would provide them. Some people call it super immunity. Uh, so. Then we want to answer one important question with the order that really matter, uh, whether you get infected first and then get vaccinated or vaccinated and then had breakthrough infection, right? So, um, for, so for that, uh, we kind of designed, um, again, uh, uh, from our cohort, we kind of come up with a plan. Um, so where we compared vaccine only groups that are fully vaccinated, meaning two doses, um, and uh, previously infected, in this case we call it hybrid immunity, um, uh, and then infected, uh, and sorry, vaccinated, uh, we were able to collect uh, from those and for from some of the individuals um, uh, blood between the two doses. So we have. Uh, previously infected one dose and also second dose. Um, and we had also breakthrough infections um, at different time points. Uh, so we collected some during the, during the uh, different stages of this uh, 
phases of the pandemic. So here I'm, I'm showing you uh, the vaccine only hybrid, meaning that previously infected and then vaccinated and then, and then breakthrough. We didn't really see a significant difference between um, previously infected and vaccinated individuals from vaccinated and, uh, and, and uh, breakthrough infection. Both provided a very, very robust antibody responses as compared to only vaccinated individuals. This is true for uh, IgG and IgA, but not for IgM. Uh, uh, the same goes, uh, the same is true for live virus neutralizing. Um, and, this, and here we are showing the original virus, alpha, beta, and delta. And again, we see this consistent increase in um, uh, neutralizing titers of uh, uh, hybrid uh, group and then the breakthrough infection group. So, uh, and then, and then obviously one important thing that we want to we want to compare with that does the dosing matter? Uh, one dose versus second dose in on in individual that were previously infected. The bottom line is we didn't have a lot of numbers in. Um, after the first, after uh, only after one dose, we only had six subjects in that uh, six individ individuals in that group, but we didn't see any difference um, in uh, a double dose and a single dose in previously infected individuals. So the bottom line is, if individual is infected before one dose is in enough. To provide really good a good um, uh, immune response, at least uh, in terms of uh, antibody response. I think that is this is consistent with other reports um, that are out there that have actually done very comprehensive studies in larger groups. So we were quite happy to see the same type of um, uh, results here. Uh, and then, then here is again the, the uh, neutralization titers. Again, as I have said, there is no difference between one dose and the second dose in individuals that were uh, already infected with COVID. Um, one thing that uh, I think was interesting is that um, for some of them, we were able to actually sequence the virus in those, uh, in those individuals that had breakthrough infections. For example, in, uh, earlier in the pandemic, the alpha uh, and, uh, variant and then the gamma and the delta. What was actually interesting in terms of their ability to neutralize, um, uh, uh, neutralize uh, the different variants is that if the breakthrough was in al with the alpha virus, uh, they were extremely good in neutralizing the alpha virus. If the breakthrough was gamma, the, uh, they, they were extremely efficient in neutralizing the gamma, which is which which shows that variant specific enhancement of response. So the, uh, the you know the idea that uh, if we could design variant specific uh, 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 vaccine, uh, uh, then it would provide variant specific um, uh, immune response. So I think this is kind of very nice. The numbers are not a lot, but 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 uh, it's, it's, I think the trend is very very clear. So uh, uh, again, as I've said, as we go through the pandemic, we um, uh, Omicron came. People were just we, we you know uh, the, the, we we saw uh, waning of antibody responses, and people start to get the third, uh, the booster, right? And then and then we call, we measured the uh, the impact of those um, individuals that had um, uh, the third dose and we compared those individuals with breakthrough infection that that really uh, 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 basically the, the 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 question that we start to ask was that this super immunity that we see in breakthrough infection as compared to uh, a two dose vaccination uh, would uh, the third dose actually act as a breakthrough infection? And the answer is yes. So here I'm showing you the antibody levels of uh, the different um, uh, group, uh, the, 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 the 
uh, this is a two dose, three dose, and the breakthrough infection. Um, overall, there is no difference between three dose vaccination versus a breakthrough infection. And the was breakthrough again to remind you, fully vaccinated two uh, Pfizer vaccines and had um, uh, COVID infection, breakthrough infection. We didn't see a difference between three dose versus breakthrough infection, which is I think um, encouraging. This is true for IgG and IgA, um, not so much so uh, with uh, IgM as we or, as, as we have seen before as well. Uh, the same true with the live virus um, uh, uh, neutralization titer. In this case, we do have actually have Omicron uh, virus as well. We were able to measure the ability of uh, three dose um, and the breakthrough infections. Um, in uh, neutralizing Omicron variant. So here, uh, after two doses, um, basically, you know, uh, the Omicron uh, neutralization is non-existent or extremely low. But after three doses, they actually get a very robust neutralization, showing, uh, telling that even though, even though the vaccine is the original, I think it is really important uh, here to, in, to, to, to emphasize that, again, uh, the vac our vaccine is from we are based on the original variant. After three doses, are able to neutralize Omicron. As the same with the with the with the breakthrough infections. That's what well. uh, I think. Um, and and uh, and uh, here I'm just showing you the correlation of the uh, just to say a little bit about the quality of antibody that we get in different groups two doses, three doses, and the breakthrough. Uh, and and, and that, as you can see, this is just to show you that um, the, uh, in breakthrough infections, um, the neutralization ability correlates well with the antibody levels. Um, and, uh, and here, uh, we, we want to kind of uh, provide a little bit measurement about the potency neutralizing ability of those antibody that are induced after three dose, two dose, and 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 uh, and a breakthrough infection. Basically, what this data mean means is that uh, um, as soon as you get you know continuous exposure, uh, it could be through vaccination or breakthrough infections and a vaccination combination of the two. Uh, you see this improvement of the antibody that our body generates um, in terms of uh, broad, broadly neutralized. We basically get a broadly neutralizing antibody as we continuously exposed to the antigen, whether it's through vaccination or natural infection, which is, I think, uh, uh, very good. Um, so we went back and we measured um, and three dose vaccination versus eight. Previously, I told you that um, we have a very uh, interesting data where we saw uh, there is a correlation between age and and the antibody levels and the neutralizing levels. Uh, basically, as, again, uh, two dose you see this um, correlation. Three dose. Uh, uh, we do see again still correlation, and in, in older people you see less. Um, even though the significant, the curve seems to be flatter. And, and breakthrough, basically, that is not the case, meaning that there is no correlation between um, uh, breakthrough and the three dose. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, between age and uh, neutralizing titer. Um, and then and I, I guess this is, again, tells you that I think a combination of natural infection and the vaccination might be the base case scenario. But again, um, but the three dose is also getting gut there. Uh, just to summarize uh, what um, I just um, uh, sh showed you, um, I think I think uh, that this is just trying to include other arms of uh, immunity. Uh, in addition to we have our antibody mediated immunity, as the previous um, speakers alluded to, we have also T cell immunity, which is even more durable uh, and more comprehensive as well. So I think 
And then as far as we can tell, I think this, this hybrid immunity, the, the combination of natural infection and a vaccination or a continuous exposure of vaccination um, provides really a robust um, immunity against um, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, just to conclude, getting vaccinated leads to more neutralizing antibodies than natural infection. In terms of an, uh, 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 antibody, uh, vaccination is much better than natural infection. Um, and that's because that's mainly because natural infection is highly variable. Age-dependent uh, response of antibody and neutralization is an important thing to consider. A combination of vaccination and natural infection gives the greatest uh, response. Uh, so uh, with this, I would like to thank um, uh, my team, the study participants, obviously, um, and, and, uh, uh, and our collaborators within OHSU and outside OHSU as well. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope I didn't go long, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and it, it, uh, your talk was uh, uh, a great compliment to the talks of Dr. Barbins and uh, Bertoletti, um, especially the little trees at the very end showing how, you know, we need it all. Um, this works really well. Um, so if, if you don't mind, um, um, if you go out of the uh, uh, share so we can see as many people's faces as possible. Great, wonderful. Thank you. So um, th this is a, a little niche question, which you, you might not uh, have information on. But what you clearly showed was that the amount of antibodies or the robust response to antibodies for people who've been uh, triple vaxxed or those who um, got an infection and then got vaccinated, um, either between vaccine one and two or uh, uh, got, got uh, a breakthrough infection, they really have the highest circulating antibody levels. So the question I would have is in regards to pregnant patients, either women who are currently pregnant, um, and is there any study showing um, how the antibodies, the IgG antibodies cross the placenta, whether there's a difference in that subpopulation? Um, and then the other population I had a concern about was in, in breast milk. Clearly, uh, breast milk has uh, antibodies that are protective. Is there a difference between people who have been um, not vaccinated and have had the infection? Because the, the community out there, there are women who say, I'm not going to get vaccinated um, because I've already had the infection and that's going to protect my child. From looking at your data, one would say that, well, that might be true, but it might not be true. And you'll definitely have a much better antibody response if you get the vaccine. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, obviously we didn't really do that study, but if I would, um, what our study would implicate is that um, I think having vaccination would guarantee you that you would have enough um, uh, uh, adequate antibody response that maybe that can be trans, you know, um, transferred into uh, to the baby. Um, and then and I think. Uh, uh, we have actually, we have been collaborating with, with other people just with, um, uh, with my, one of my colleagues in Texas to collaborate. To, we, we just got samples, placenta samples actually to measure that, to answer this very, very specific question. But I don't, we didn't really measure it yet. But I think one thing that to emphasize is, I think there is one study that showed very clearly that individuals that have vaccinated, um, pregnant women that were vaccinated have better protected um, uh, the, the, from the, I think the babies were protected from COVID. So um, there is all science show that vaccination would help um, uh, in protecting from COVID. Fantastic, wonderful. Um, any of the other commissioners have a, uh, a question? Seeing none. All right. So, um, talk to, to uh, oftentimes to, to our speakers. Um, uh, th these are wonderful uh, lectures or, or presentations that you've done. 
um, they're at a level that is obviously at a very high degree of cell biology, which is a little bit different from uh, usually the commission is seeing a lot more public health stuff. But we think it's imperative um, that the city of Los Angeles and the commission um, be updated on the cutting edge. And, and, and three of you are really at the cutting edge. And we really respect the research work that you're doing. And, and also we're honored that you take time uh, from your busy schedules to come to present to the the entire people of the city of Los Angeles and specifically the commission. So I thank you. We have some uh, um, uh, uh, public business to, to do. Uh, it's getting late. I, you do not have to stay on for our technical uh, 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 votes, et cetera. Uh, but we're really thrilled that you joined us, and we're really honored that, that you would take time um, to speak to us. And it was very, very informative. And we're very appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Good night. Thank you. Bye. So, so um, going back uh, to, to the city clerk, I think um, we need to do um, two things. Uh, one is uh, approve the minutes um, from other two um, minutes that we have to approve. We have to approves the minutes from uh, January, uh, and then we have the, the brief meeting in February. Uh, there is a problem with um, the template that we have um, in our system for that special meeting. Uh, so I'm waiting for them to fix that so I can generate those um, February, I believe, February 8th um, special. <laughs> Uh, agenda minutes, but we do have the January 10, 2022 um, okay. meeting minutes. Um, does somebody want to uh, make a motion to approve those meetings? I make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, minutes from January 10th. Uh, thank, thank you, Commissioner Sirota. And, uh, Commissioner Hissarix is second uh, that. Um, any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, do you want to take a roll for that? Okay, Commissioner Avila, um, I believe, is uh, still absent. Commissioner Estrada, absent. Commissioner Gavidia is absent. Commissioner Grimmick? Matt, can you hear us? I'll come back. Commissioner Hissarik? He approved. Commissioner Cato. Approved. Commissioner Calfani. Approved. Commissioner Lemus. Commissioner Lemus, I will come back. Uh, Commissioner yes. Mandel. I approve. I think uh, Commissioner Lemus might have dropped off. Yes. Um, Commissioner Osi. I'll be upstanding. I don't recall uh, being in attendance at the January meeting. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Pack is uh, absent. Commissioner Shannon. Approved. Commissioner Sorota. Approved. Uh, Commissioner Grimmig. Uh, I. Commissioner Grimmig is still here. Anyway, the uh, motion does carry. Okay, we'll we'll get back to him. Um, wonderful, thank you. And then, um, Councillor Vaughn, you wanted to bring up uh, a new assembly bill or state senate bill? Yes, uh, we still have to take public comment too, uh, as well. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone in the room. If Lauren or Sarah notice of anybody before I go. They're shaking no. There's currently no one waiting. So let me just make, let me if, I, if I can interrupt, just uh, uh, Sarah, was there somebody there beforehand that dropped off or no? No, no. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so just we're we're clear for that for the public record. Um, thank you. And and uh, for the neighborhood council, um, is there anybody in the neighborhood council seeing none? Uh, Councilor Vaughn, you're up. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. I just want to uh, update the commission on that um, February 10th in the California Assembly, a, uh, Assembly Bill 1944 was introduced, which would allow for telecommuting to occur outside of a state of emergency um, and would allow uh, it, it, certain parameters. But one thing that's important is telecommuting currently uh, outside of a state of, uh, without in a state of emergency would require that all the speakers home address and addresses be present where they are speaking. That has, in this bill, that will be eliminated, which is important. Um, but so at this point, there, it was introduced. I don't know where it stands. I will update the commission um, as it goes through. What I will also do, so all the commissioners have it, is I will forward the legislation to Rita. And Rita can disseminate that information to everyone should you want to in your individual capacity. Uh, talk to your assembly person and see where they stand on it. Uh, we, uh, the commission can't send a letter in for or against it. It just does not, we, you, it, we don't have the authority to do that. However, as individuals, you could. Um, but I will send it out to, and give everyone a status on that. Any questions? This is excellent. Thank you. Any commissioners have any questions? Any commissioners uh, want to uh, make a, a comment uh, or a suggestion for future discussion? Uh, Hi, this is Commissioner Shannon. I think I'd mentioned that I wanted to um, have a presentation on fentanyl and um, you know, drug use, particularly among our unhoused community, and how it's affecting, you know, some of these new drugs are affecting some of our folks on the street. Yeah, we, um, I think we heard you at the last meeting, and we're researching to get uh, leading experts on that. But thank you. Uh, Rita, did you have your, your hand go up? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just want to confirm that um, we do have uh, the March meeting scheduled for the 14th. Um, and so just want to rem uh, remind folks we have that. That will allow us to take action again on AB um, 361, although uh, things are changing, so I'm not really sure where we uh, are going to go from here. But in any case, if for some reason we don't meet on the 14th, we would have to have a special meeting the week of the um, 28th um, to uh, stay in, in line with the uh, requirements of AB 361. So that's just an FYI. Our hope would be that we would uh, be on the 14th. I realize it's just a couple weeks from now. But I think our hope would be that we would we would be there. Any other suggestions or concepts? Any of the research associates want to see puzzled looks? And then, reader, your hand's still up. Is that just from before, or another comment? All right, seeing none, then uh, uh, I will um, ask for a motion for adjournment. I'll move to adjourn. Thank you, Commissioner Cotto. This is a second. Nobody wants to adjourn. Second. I second. Uh, Vice President Asi, thank you. Um, any uh, discussion about adjournment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed or abstaining? Hearing none, um, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate all your volunteer efforts to improve the health.